Okay, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. I'm Mike Davis. We talk about Lovecraftian horror, cosmic horror, horror movies, films, books, weird fiction. What Matt Carpenter is here. DeBronzo is here. Pete's coming right back, and Rick is here. We'll have you guys do introductions in a second. And our guest today is Alicia Hilton. Hey, Alicia, good to see you again. Great to see you, too. Uh, Matt Carpenter, yes. I'll bet you have a prize, and I'll bet you want to tell us about Movie Night last night. Yeah, Movie Night, uh, we watched two separate films. We watched um, The Last Case of August T. Harrison, which is an artsy kind of, it was a student project or amateur product, strictly for the film festival circuit about a private investigator who runs across Lovecraftian horrors. Very low budget, but it was only an hour, and for what it was, it was certainly enjoyable enough. The second was more a parody film, not unlike The Lost Skeleton of Cadavra. This was Lake Michigan Monster. It was an hour and 15 minutes, and it was a dog. It was like almost unwatchable. I, I think it would come alive in a movie theater full of film festival fans who are feeling rowdy like The Midnight Show. Or if you had 10 people over to your house and gave them all a six pack of beer to drink before you watched it or some weed, you'd have a blast. But by the end, it was like, oh, my God, will this never be over? Anyway, <laughs> the prize today is a copy of the volume one uh, graphic novel of The Old Guard. This is that really entertaining movie. With, I think Charlize Theron was in it. Um, but this is the graphic novel it was based on. There's. Pretty nice art. If you want to win a copy, the copy, the only copy, send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com. Put guard in the subject heading. We'll draw a winner in about six weeks. Maybe it'll be you. I, I love how you showed someone getting shot and said this is pretty nice art. It is. <laughs> All right. So, DeBronzo, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is uh, Mike DeBronzo, architect and artist. Pete, you're back. I am back. I apologize. I am Pete you Rawlings, should. Uh author, editor, um, occasional fisherman, and today I am a paint monkey. Uh, my wife and kids are painting the downstairs, and I have been tasked with doing all the little things that, you know, oh, they well, won't do. That's a you're you're a good dad and husband. I try. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, a really good dad gets the wife and kids to do the painting. <laughs> oh no, no. See, I have made it very, very clear that I will only paint every ten years. My wife likes to paint every five years. Well. So. Did you ever hear the old? 70. What, Rick? Well, well he compromised at seventy years. <laughs> well, no, no. We still paint every five years. She just does it by herself every other time. Reminds me of, of the old joke about who's the real cowboy in a pickup truck before they had back seats. Yeah. There's three cowboys sitting in it. So driver's seat, passenger seat, and in the middle. Which one's the real cowboy? The one in the middle. Right. You know why? Because he's throttling the Go ahead. No, that's not why, Pete, but thank you. Uh, because he doesn't have to drive and he doesn't have to open the gate when they get back to the ranch. Okay. All right. I'm sure someone out there is laughing. Uh, at that. I get it. Directly funny. Thanks, Mike. You're, you're welcome. That's, is that Texas humor? Uh, oh. I suppose. Okay. We're going to like open mic when we go to Providence, baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rick. Wait, you're going to open mic? I'll bring my dissection kit. You can bring... <laughs> I assume you're talking about DeBronzo. Rick, you want to introduce yourself, yeah, bud? I'm Rick, Rick Lay, writer and full magazine collector. Okay, so everybody uh, to the audience, please uh, do us a couple of favors, if you wouldn't mind. If you watch on YouTube, commenting and clicking the like button really helps out a lot. Um, a lot of people watch the premiere 
on Sundays at, at 6 p.m. But whether you do or not, commenting in the comments below uh, helps out a lot, I'm told, with the YouTube algorithm. So the other thing is that the other thing that really, really helps is reviews on Apple. So those two things, no matter where you listen, if you listen on Spotify, uh, I always link to the YouTube video in the in the audio podcast. If you will head over to YouTube, maybe make a comment. And, you know, if you haven't written a review about the show on Apple yet, uh, slash iTunes, believe me, that really, really helps as well. So, you know, we've, we've always been the little podcast that could, and I'm trying to reach more people. And those of you who are listening, I assume you're doing that because either you haven't found anything better or you actually like us. So <laughs> anyway, it's just me laughing at my own jokes again. Thank you, Matt. You tell enough dad jokes that you ought to laugh at mine every once in a while. Don't you think? Uh, I, I laugh at my jokes because they're funny. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I, Alicia, welcome back. Thank you very much for having me. How are you? Me. I'm doing well, thank you. Well, we we talked with you, and I want to do a little refresher. Mm -hmm. um, we talked to you a few months back about an anthology called Back to Omni Park. Uh, I'm just going on memory here. I couldn't find my notes on it. Okay. Talk just a little bit about how you got involved with that as an editor and a, and a writer and what Omni Park is, the first one and the, this new second one and so forth. All right. Um, the first uh, book in the series is called Tales from Omni Park. And I got involved in that because I submitted a story for the anthology, which was accepted and published in Tales from Om Omni Park. And the first anthology is not something you necessarily have to read before you read Back to Omni Park, because Back to Omni Park is a prequel. So the anthology that I co-edited, the stories take place before the first book, you know, takes place. So the first anthology was a mix of science fiction and horror leaning sort of more towards science fiction. And the latest book, which is just published this last month, Back to Omni Park, which I co-edited and I have a story in it too, is a horror anthology that also has some science fiction and some fantasy elements in it. Um, both books takes place in a shared world, Omni Park. It is a theme park sort of like Epcot Center, but much weirder. Um, it is a theme park that was in Texas, and it was started by a man named Dr. Dalton Teague. The thing about Omni Park that is strange is there are these seven realms, and they actually contain portals to take you into other dimensions of our world and into other worlds, including space. So is it real? Is it not real? You have to make up your mind when you read the anthology. But even though the stories are all individual stories written by phenomenal authors like Laird Barron, Brian Evanston, Jonathan Mayberry, Christy Demeester, Gwendolyn Keist, A.C. Weiss, John Wiswell, John Palisano, myself, you know, some and other tremendous horror authors. Each story is an individual story but they all take place in this shared well realm. And the stories are suspenseful. All of them are suspenseful. They all, you know, will invoke some feelings of dread. But the thing that to me makes the book special is the characterizations are just phenomenal. The world building is phenomenal. Each story will make the reader feel something. And to me, when I read horror, Horror doesn't move me unless I feel something about the characters. You know, a victim should be more than me, essentially. And so all of these stories will just immerse the reader in the world of Omni Park and all the strange dimensions. And they give you glimpses into different types of horror. We've got supernatural horror. We have horror that blends with crime fiction. We have horror that blends with science fiction, horror that blends with fantasy and it's all kind of connected together. So you have a shared world, 
but different glimpses of parts of the world, you know, like for instance, um, Brian Evanson's story is set in the realm between the realms and that's the title of his story. And that was a VIP area in Omni Park where some truly, you know, terrifying and weird things happened. You know, so it's just a phenomenal anthology and unusual because it is a shared world, but the quality of the writing is stupendous. And it was so exciting for me to recruit the authors because some of my very favorite authors, you know, contributed stories for this book. Yeah, uh, about, Jessica, I'm sorry, Mike. Uh, go ahead. This, this got funding through Kickstarter, right? Yes, it got funding through Kickstarter. And so, like the original anthology came out, it was a Kickstarter. Then this Omni Park 2 was a Kickstarter as well. Made a little bit of money. Unfortunately, I wish it had made more. Uh, uh, the original anthology probably hasn't made much of any money. And this this book that's just come out, we paid each of the authors very high rates, you know, higher than typical pro rates. Uh, so we will need to sell lots of books to actually make any money. But Ben right. Tyler and I, uh, you know, we wanted to come out with like essentially an anthology that would be thought of as one of the best best books of the year in 2023. That was our goal. Um, so, the first anthology was on the preliminary ballot for the Bram Stoker Award. And we're hoping that Back to Omni Park will be on the final ballot for the Bram Stoker Award. So I'm hoping a lot of people will read it when they get the book in their hands. So uh, just so I'm uh, getting it straight, because there was also a third Kickstarter, which was, I guess, just a reissue of the first one in paperback. Um, when the... Like I said, the, with the first anthology, I was just one of the authors. I wasn't involved I in the editing aspect of the book at all. Um, there were two Kickstarters for the first book. I see. I think that they, what happened was is the first Kickstarter didn't fund, and then the goal uh -huh. changed, and then the, then the second Kickstarter did fund. And yeah, so that really was the first anthology. And the second anthology, which to me, the first anthology was a fantastic book really great and it was mentioned by ellen datlaw in her best horror of the year and i know brian evanson's story was reprinted in ellen datlaw's best horror of the year um this is i'm talking about tales from omni park the first anthology and um gemma files story I, I believe was shortlisted for best horror of the year so but the current book which just came out last month back to omni park you know, it none of it's been reprinted yet because it's a uh, book, book. But I think it's an even better book. And yeah, it's just I was just I it made more money. It made only like five thousand on the Kickstarter. I just I guess I don't get it. Why if it's you know, it seems like such an attractive book when I, I backed the Kickstarter, I was just yeah, just like, I thought there's make a lot of competition money. out there for there's, first of all. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, and some of the authors, you know, like Jonathan Maybury, he's an editor himself and he he publishes a lot. There, there are many different projects out there. And so it's a matter of, you know, timing and, and how things get promoted. It's And so it's not, and I wouldn't call it, you know, making money. I would call it essentially pre-selling because- Right, it's just people, raising funds so you can print the book. Yeah, it, it was- it was basically raising some money by pre-sales and also just to get some buzz out there and to get people to know about the book before it came out. Yeah. So and a, a couple of things. Um, what you said about the characters. Yes. Uh, really reminds me of several conversations we've had on this show, the, my fellow panelists, about the Godzilla minus one movie. Mm -hmm. And I still haven't seen it, but those of you who have can speak to it better than me, but you were telling me how one of the things that made this Godzilla film so much better is that the characters were really well developed. Is it would that be accurate? Um, whoever wants to yeah. comment. Yeah, no, it's the movie, it's especially compared to what's come before. You know, it when you watch that movie, characters are usually a nuisance in a Godzilla movie. They're there to move the plot along or to look, look up and go, oh. Right. But, um, or to get eaten. Yeah. Or but both. in minus one, it, it's like a very, like it's, they're talking about like it's end of World War II. 
I won't get into the whole thing, but it's, you know, it's, there's, it's a very good story and very strong characters and that carries through the movie. It's not just about a giant irradiated lizard, you know, right. that's great. And it's the, you know, that's why people are going to see that movie, but you're getting so much more with it. So yeah, yeah. In, many, in many ways, Godzilla is a disaster. Godzilla minus one is a disaster film. Yeah. Um, you've got a guy who survives world war two. Um, through and and that leaves him traumatized yeah um, and how he's received when he goes back too yeah and then something that happened during world war ii comes back to haunt him and everybody else mm. um and uh he has a chance to make things right uh yeah yeah anyway it's a good flick and it and one of the things that you know and yes look i love a good godzilla film i love to see monsters fighting monsters that's yeah. that's great um but one of the things that this film does is it gives you character development on on the main characters and some minor characters and, ex and it explains why there's why why they would go out of their way to fight this un unstoppable force. And you actually care about them. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing. That's why I brought up Godzilla Minus One because of what you were saying, Alicia. Um, yes. About caring for the characters. Mm -hmm. I haven't sense. seen the movie, mm -hmm. but uh, the TV show, which is made by the regular Godzilla universe, uh, Monarch Legacy of Monsters, has the same uh, uh, facet of making you care for the characters. I, I do have a, a kind of question for Alicia because this sure. is, you went with this Omni Park book, you went right into like one of those things that I really like, which is it's in a theme park. Mm -hmm. And I love horror set in carnivals, traveling shows, you know, fun houses. I think that just adds you you already started out with such a great idea for the environment of the show, you know, the environment of the the book. Was that like a thing for you to like to do amusement park horror or anything like that? Um, well, Ben Thomas, my co-editor, is the one who came up with the the whole concept for Omni Park. Like mm -hmm. I said, you have to decide whether it's real or not, but but Ben Thomas is the creator of Omni Park, and he was the sole editor for the first anthology. And then I came in as co-editor for the second anthology. And we, I, I, you know, along with him, you know, we decided to take the second anthology more in the horror direction, because one of the reasons is that that's what I really love to write is horror. And most of what I write is cross genres. So I'm blending my genres. And when it came to time to recruit the authors, I recruited a, a mix of authors who were all like preeminent horror authors and who sometimes also blend, you know, science fiction, fantasy, North fantasy. And, and to me, Omni Park, just the concept of the realms and being able to go into different portals of, of other worlds or different dimensions of our world and also the aspect to me, one of the themes that comes up a lot in my writing is change, you know, metamorphosis, transformation. And so the ability to change the characters and change the atmosphere and create different kinds of monsters, whether they're human monsters or, or other monsters, you know, this all having this world of Omnipark all facilitated that. So that's fascinating to me. And I had written, um, one story before that takes place at, at uh, well, actually two, two stories that take place at carnivals. So I'm, I'm not a stranger to writing horror that is set in, you know, a carnival, although Omni Park is a theme park. It's not a carnival. There is a difference, but I, I had a horror story that took place at a carnival that I wrote before that was published in um, a um, anthology that was, um, clowning around Big Top, where wishes and nightmares come true, was the title of my story that was published in a different anthology. So, to me, any where can kind people of, read um, that? Yeah, um, I can pull it. Let's see, where is it? Um, that story. There we go. 
Um, I have all, all my publications on my desk here. Mm -hmm. uh, so this uh, funny as a heart attack is the anthology where clowning around big top was published. So if, if someone wants to read that, funny uh, as yeah, a heart sure. attack. Funny as a heart yeah. attack. My website, aliciaholton.com, has a list of all my publications on it. I need to update it because I have um, a couple of new poems that were just published. But if you go to aliciaholton.com, there's the, the writing section and it, and it lists my stories, my poetry, and I'm working on some long form fiction now. So I'll link to that in the show notes, uh, everybody. And, you know, we'll, we'll I wanted to talk about Omnipart just briefly yes. and then get into an introduction of, of you. Mm -hmm. But the other th thing I want to mention about Omnipart is, well, first of all, you, you have uh, prominent writers like Laird Barron and Brian Evanson and, and I forget who all else, but that's, that, that's a draw for those who haven't bought this or, or read this yet. And the other thing is, you know, I, Rick and I were talking about some several Sherlock Holmes uh, in, you know, it, Lovecraftian Sherlock Holmes anthology, for example, Shadows mm -hmm. Over Baker Street. Let's just use that as one example. All the stories in that anthology, they're, they don't exist in the same universe. And to have an anthology that, you know, one a story that one author writes is in the exact same let's say version of the part that another author writes i like that 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 makes it even more interesting in my view so and uh the other thing i was going to ask is uh you said it just came out in december is yes. it available to purchase for those who didn't get it on the kickstarter yes um if you go to amazon you can buy the ebook you can buy the hardcover and you can buy the paperback they're all there um, just back to Omnipod is the book's title. And, and that's, a, that's a two, by the way, folks. In yes, it is a number two, two not not the, you know. Right. The, uh, so back to Omnipark. And it's not necessarily, like I said, to read the first anthology, Tales from Omnipark. You certainly can if you want. But back to Omnipark is a prequel. So the stories all take place either in the first couple of years after the park was opened and, and some of them involve time travel. So they, they go into the future, they go into the past, but all of, all of the stories are prequels. So it's the early days of the park and it essentially is like the very beginning of the park, but we do have some time travel. So you're going right. into the future as well. Well, it, and the other thing you mentioned was that the first one was more sci-fi and this one's more horror. Did I understand that correctly? That is correct. That The yeah. first... So and my, obviously did have horror in it because like I said, Brian Evanson's story from the first anthology was reprinted in Ellen Datlow's Best Horror of the Year. Um, so it was a horror anthology, but it sort of weighed a little bit more on science fiction. The right. story that I had in there was a blended genre story, stellar nucleosynthesis and the infinite power of love. That story was a blend of science fiction, horror. Um, well, I guess my point is for our audience, Yes. Um, I mean, a lot of us are into sci-fi. I'm. I, I am. But uh, probably many more horror. So if if you want to start with one, folks that you haven't read yet, yeah, start with Back to Omni Park. Definitely. Yeah. So, okay, I asked you about. And I'll I'll include a link to your website and to uh, Back to Omni Park in the show notes. So, I wasn't aware of this actually the last time we talked excuse me and then i i was on your website and i thought wow i'm gonna have to have alicia back because she's a very interesting person let me just read this from alicia's website uh, author law professor arbitrator actor former fbi special agent scorpio <laughs> fueled by green tea and imagination whether you're here, for, whether you're familiar with my fiction and poetry, or you want to learn more about law and law enforcement, I'm glad you stopped by. Again, this is AliciaHilton.com. And uh, to continue, you say you can find out about upcoming speaking engagements and book signings 
on the news and events page, publications on the writing page, as you mentioned a minute ago, Alicia, and learn about writing workshops, workshops and manuscript critiques on the workshops and consulting services page. So, wow, you have a lot of hats. Yeah. <laughs> I do indeed. Yeah. I, I, I think that, you know, a lot of people, maybe less and less as time goes by, but have the idea that, you know, when you start off in life, whatever you decide that you're going to be, okay, you've decided that now you're stuck. And if you're, you know, 42 years old or how, however old you are, you're, you need to abide by the decision that an 18 or a 19 year old version of you made. And so I think that it's a very brave thing. My wife, for example, she went to law school and she was a prosecutor for years. And then when we moved down to Texas, she decided that she wanted to become a school teacher and she teaches high school English. And um, it, it pays less. I mean, I think we all know that teachers sh should be paid more, but for her, it's far more fulfilling, you know? So for her personally, she feels like she's really making a huge difference. And so that's another reason why I wanted to talk to you, Alicia, because I, I admire that. And I like to have people on the show that I, you know, have done something that I think is interesting or they are interesting or combination of both. So I wanted to ask you about all this stuff. Sure. Um, let's start with other horror or writings that you've, you've done, which will be on your webpage. And then let's get into the other stuff like mm -hmm. FBI, law enforcement, and all that stuff. So besides Back to Omni Park, tell us a little bit more about your work. Poetry too, I believe I saw, right? Yes. Um, I started writing poetry before I started writing fiction. When I was 12, I had an English teacher that encouraged me to enter a poetry contest. And it was for high school students, but I entered it and I won it. Um, so nice. that was, uh, the first time I had a poem. And you were 12 and it was for high school students? I was 12. Oh, yeah. well, nice job. Uh, yeah. So... <laughs> I I haven't like consistently been writing poetry since I was 12, but I started off as a poet. And actually, as a rule, poets don't get paid a lot. <laughs> no, right? they don't get paid a lot. That, that is true. But it's not I, I'd love to share my poetry with the world. And some of my poems have been published in multiple places. And I've now been published in more than a dozen countries, which is kind of cool to reach readers, you know, all across the oceans. Absolutely. So, I wrote a couple of, I have a couple of books on my desk that, you know, talk about my influences a little bit. So my, my mother encouraged me to write when I was a kid and I was always given lots of books. I'm a voracious reader. I started reading when I was in kindergarten and like one of the early books I loved was Charlotte's Web. I read that when I was in the first grade and then I started to read horror. My mother gave me uh, this book, Hose Tales, a Mystery oh, yeah. and Imagination, and this edition is from 1935, so I don't know if my mother got it at a used bookstore or if it's something that she had been given herself, you know, by somebody else, but I, I loved Edgar Allan Poe when I was a kid and was um, fascinated by the psychological aspect of his writing and you know the just the ability to instill fear and to invoke dread and so i got interested in in writing horror myself and then i also was very interested in crime fiction my dad used to love to read mario puzo like i read the godfather when i was probably about 12 or so and started reading, you know, like Fools Die and, and then John Le Carre, you know, spy novels. And so books have always been part of my life. And then I started to write fiction, I guess, gosh, maybe about 20 years ago. And at first just writing a few things. And now I write both fiction and poetry. This past year, 2023, one of my goals was to come, you know, compile my poems that I'd written that I loved and then write a lot of new poems into a manuscript, which I have now finished. It's about 75 poems and I'm going to be shopping that and hopefully find a publisher 
so that everyone will be able to read, you know, my favorite poems all in, in one collection. Before so that, you continue, what kind of poetry will be in that volume or um, is in that volume? It, what is in the volume? It's a mix of horror and science fiction and fantasy and some what you would call like literary poetry that doesn't have speculative elements. I like to write about human nature. I like to be, write about nature and I like to write about all kinds of monsters, whether they're human monsters or creatures from other worlds. And to me, the idea of a monster is something that's fascinating because I like gray areas, gray areas in terms of morality and ethics. And when you also think about, you know, subjugation and justice, you, you know, these are themes that come into my writing a lot. And I don't think that there is any person or creature that is all evil or all good. So to me, the moral gray areas are fascinating. And so I, I write a lot about that. And and I'm, I'm very imagistic in terms of being able to invoke, you know, all the senses. You know, I like to incorporate all the senses when I write and the sixth sense, too. So, you know, it's very imaginative and you, you'll see crime blended with horror, blended with science fiction, blended with observations about nature and human nature. Well, that's, uh, that's the yeah, poetry. Okay, so if someone listening, they're interested in checking out your poetry, your horror stories, uh, so on, so on and so forth. Uh, if they go to aliciahilton.com and click on the writing page, yes. then they can go from there, correct? They can go from there. And, you know, then I've sold some things recently. Like this week, I sold two stories and those, you know, they'll Congratulations. out. And then I've, thank you. And then I've sold other poems. And right now I am working on a supernatural thriller. It is, there's nothing about that on the website yet. It's um, probably going to be a novella when it's done. I'm, I'm, I'm in about, I've written about 10,000 words of that so far. And we'll see where that goes. And then I have an, a novel that I'm working on to Twisted Helix. That's, there is some information on that on the website, but I'm not going to finish that until I finish the project that I'm working on right now. Right. So I, I'm always writing. That's that's what I spend most of my time doing is writing the the arbitration and the acting. Um, that's part time, you know, work that I do occasionally. Okay, so let's talk about your your past. The F, yes. being an FBI agent, a law mm -hmm. professor. Uh, okay, so you're 18, 19 years old. What comes first? What 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 happened from there? Um. I went to undergrad at um, University of California, Berkeley, and while I was a student, I worked as an art dealer at three fine art galleries in San Francisco. When oh, I was, that hat's not even on your website. You got a lot of yeah. It's, of I mean, as I things. said, it, it's <laughs> that's not on the website. I right. I also was a model and did acting. So my grandmother was a volunteer in a museum. Uh, she was a docent in the local art museum in Portland, Oregon. And she was really interested in art history. And so as a kid, I read a lot of art history books and she would pass them on to me. And I was fascinated with art. I'm not very good at drawing. I've done some work in ceramics, but I'm not, not great at drawing painting, but I appreciate it. And I, it's kind of a funny fluke. I had an agent to, for my modeling and my acting when I was a teenager. And I got this modeling job at an art gallery, um, San Francisco Art Exchange, where they're having an opening for Alberta Vargas's art, his original paintings and lithographs. And I was there to be in an evening gown and hand out the information to people who came into the art gallery. And while I was there, I talked to the owners of the gallery about my background because I was studying art history at Berkeley too. That I was a sociology major, but I also studied art history. And so I essentially wowed them with my knowledge of art and I loved Alberto Vargas's work you know he was someone who painted the pinup you know art I loved his work and one of their salespeople was out with like back surgery and they so they had an opening for sales perch and I got hired um, so that was my first experience working in a gallery when I was in college and after that salesperson came back and because it was a temporary position, I got recommended and I went to another gallery and then a third gallery after that. So 
I put myself through school at Berkeley. I paid for my tuition by working full-time selling art and um, then doing some modeling. I, I just want to throw in here, every time I speak to someone, uh, like one of my patrons and friends, Robert, um, is a painter. Mm -hmm. And he's obviously into horror if he listens to us every Sunday or every week, whenever someone happens to listen. Uh, but I always ask this question that I'm about to ask you. Have you read The Man in the Picture by Susan Hill by chance? Not yet. It's a novella. Mm -hmm. uh, she's the same writer who uh, wrote The Woman in Black. Oh, which, okay. You, know, you guys are probably familiar with. Uh, the Man in the Picture is, like I said, it's a novella, and you might even say a small novella. But it's one of the best novellas I've I've ever read, and it's available on Audible with a really great narrator if you're an audiobook person, and I think it's available in Kindle as well. But just to you and to everyone out there listening who hasn't heard me say this yet, really ought to read this book. It's just so interesting and so terrifying at the same time. So mm -hmm. if you get around to reading it sometime, I'm sure you're tbr pile is as high as as mine but if oh, yeah. you get around to reading it at some point you'll have to email me and, and tell me what you think so i will that sounds great i think susan hill is just a phenomenal uh, writer sounds great yeah so yeah so that's how i put myself through berkeley and then after i graduated i went to work for a canon dealership selling the the big copiers uh, after doing that, I went to work at Merrill Lynch as a financial consultant and was mostly, you know, selling stocks, um, other types of investments for my clients. And from no, there, from, from the selling audience. art to financial consultant. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> well, you know, they're all sales jobs. And right, that's true. I, I'm smart. I learn pretty easily if I focus on something i'm a very motivated person so if i want to learn something i really just like dive in and absorb myself in it right. and i had had a friend who was working in investment banking and he had started off his career with merrill lynch and he said oh you should go to merrill lynch you'll make lots of money you know it's a good career and so i thought oh you know and then he called up the manager and told him about me and i got an interview and got hired and so that's how i ended up merrill lynch and from there, I went to the FBI. Um, nobody in my family had worked in law enforcement, but my father was an attorney and my grandfather was an attorney. I had, you know, people back in my family tree who were in the military, who were in politics. And I was fascinated with the idea of working in law enforcement and serving my country and justice for people who've been victims has always been something really important to me. And I also am really interested in animal rights, but I was interested in, in helping people to, you know, obtain justice and also protecting people from crime. And the thrill of it, frankly, was a lure tour. And so I sure. applied to be an FBI agent and got hired. And that is the, the best job I've ever had in terms of working for an organization. The FBI was like the preeminent law enforcement organization when I was working there. My colleagues were tremendous you had a, a lot of camaraderie in the squad, and I knew I was making a big difference with the cases I was working. I worked um, for a counterintelligence against the Russians, and I also worked criminal undercover. I was deep cover for about two and a half years in two cases posing as a drug dealer with ties to organized crime. And through my undercover work, I you know, got terrorists arrested, organized crime figures, murderers, human traffickers, counterfeiters, you know, some really awful, violent people. Speaking I got of making people. a difference. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, can I back up one second? You were, when you went to college, was, mm -hmm. was it always in your mind that you wanted to get into law enforcement and, and or the FBI or, or how did that happen? Was it that your intention all along or no? It wasn't my intention all along. I think, you know, when you think about why do you do things, I think part of this may have been just part of it through books, frankly. You know, like sure. I said, when I was a kid, I, I loved The Godfather, you know, 
12 year olds aren't you know normally reading things like the godfather but i i read all of mario puzo's books because my, my dad was a big fan of his work I, I also read you know spy novels they were fascinating and then sometimes my dad was really into reading my mother liked the horror and she was also really into poetry so so i was reading both of these things um but I also read some nonfiction about actual criminal cases. So I had a, a really keen interest in crime and in law enforcement. And then when I was an undergrad in sociology at Berkeley, you know, the FBI did recruit some on campus. I never talked to a recruiter, but I started studying Taekwondo as well and got a green belt. And my taekwondo instructor had trained some people who went into law enforcement he also trained people in the military and so i just started thinking more and more about law enforcement and how i could make a difference and contribute and you know i thought about my experience with acting how i knew about financial crimes how i had studied you know espionage cases i'd studied you know organized crime cases serial killers you know i'd i'd read all these things and so i thought i could do this and I applied and I got hired and it was a tremendous career. And just as a funny coincidence, one of the books my dad gave me was uh, called Breaking the Ring. It was about the John Walker spy ring. And I read that book right, right as the, during the time I was applying to be an FBI agent. And so that was a nonfiction book about the John Barron spy ring. Right. And coincidentally, part of my the interview process is to do a panel interview, at least back when I was hired. You, you're you put in a room with three agents for about three hours and they just drill you with questions. And one of the people who interviewed me was the case agent for the John Barron case. Oh, wow. And I had just finished reading Breaking the Ring. And when I sat across from him because his picture was the book, I was like, holy shit, you know, this is the case agent. And I said, were you the case agent for the John Baron case and he started to blush and it was really funny to see this black <laughs> he blushed and I said I just read Breaking the Ring and I'm sure that helped me to get get oh, hired. I'm sure you made a great impression and it was a yeah. it was a weird coincidence that I had just read that book and here I'm sitting across the table from someone who had solve like one of the biggest most devastating espionage cases right but you know what they say about opportunity which I, I really believe is mm -hmm. that um you know when coincidences like that happen they can happen whether you're prepared or not so yeah. you know why not be prepared you know it's when exactly. opportunities happen when coincidence and preparation meet in mm -hmm. a lot of in a lot of ways exactly yeah. So, like I said, I'm I'm always been kind of a hard charging, motivated person. I just like throw myself into things. So if I'm interested in something, I'll just throw myself into it and really get deep into the material and and. Learn. and that's why Back to Homney Park is a good book for starters, folks. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I really threw myself into that project because I love being involved in the first anthology and I love the concept. And I had ideas in my head about where another book could go and i also had you know because i'm i'm well read i knew a lot of horror authors i i you know network with people and i just thought you know these are people that i could envision writing omni park stories and when i approached them it was really exciting to recruit authors and to to you know dialogue with them out about story ideas because some of them they they literally like asked me like what could i write about and so i was giving them sure. ideas and debating and saying well you know, because sometimes like you're talking about seeing the different aspects of the realms. Well, with a few of the realms, because there's seven, and obviously we have more than seven stories, you know, it's 15 original stories plus an original poem. So with some of the realms, we had more than one story taking place in the realm, but those stories didn't overlap. They give you different glimpses of what could happen in the realms and different people who worked in the realms. And so it was really interesting to shape the book myself you know to collaborate with the authors about ideas and directions and also to help them with world building in terms of what the place looked like and obviously my co-editor ben thomas like i said is the creator of omni park and was very involved with the editing and right. as well um well then getting back to the fbi yes uh, i don't know the protocol here of mm -hmm. what you can answer and what you can't answer 
but can you talk can you give more detail about the time that you were undercover the times that you were sure. undercover, and yeah and why and what it, what it accomplished and maybe the challenges to you personally because i imagine it to be an extremely challenging thing to do it is um one of the things i'll mention about law enforcement is that when you watch um how law enforcement is depicted in tv series and in movies and in you know books that are they're fiction a lot of times the people who write um get things wrong um so people sometimes have this erroneous belief that agents who don't have experience in undercover work get recruited and be, are told you've got to do this. That's, that does not happen. Not at all. It's like further from the truth. Um, most agents never work undercover. If you want to do it, you have to proactively put yourself forward and you have to go to training. So I had already been working in counterintelligence. You know, that's what I was assigned to do, working the Russians, which I think partially was because I knew about that they're inspiring and I was really interested in that before I became an agent. I'd, I'd love for you to circle back to that in a minute too. So. It's something I excelled at when I was at the academy too. And we had guests from other offices come in and you know, I was also very good at profiling. And the profiling I worked on was about espionage. So I think that's why I started working counterintelligence. But after I'd done that for a while in my free time, I also helped out other squads. So I helped out like violent crimes, major offenders with a um, um, multiple homicide case involving an investment, you know, a, a broker who murdered the whole family, his client. Um, so I started getting more interested in doing criminal work. And with my acting background, I thought I might have the ability to work undercover. So I approached my supervisor and I said, hey, can you send me to the undercover school? And he's like, are you crazy? It's really dangerous work. You don't want to do that. And I didn't drop it. I kept pushing and I kept pushing. And so finally he sent me to an in-service. That's what you call further training. It's an in-service. And I went to the undercover school. And at the undercover school, it was done at an offsite and I met people from different FBI offices. Some of them were people who were experienced undercover agents, and some of them were people who were support, who worked behind the scenes on things like backstopping. Backstopping is your false identity, you know, whether it's your ID or the, the car you drive or the apartment you have, you know, everything that supports your identity. And so that's how I met the person who became my undercover partner. He was one of the speakers. He was a very experienced undercover agent, uh, someone who was American, but his first language was French, second language was Spanish, third language was English. Later on, he learned uh, Italian, and now he's fluent in Chinese. And wow. so he had uh, a mother who, both of his parents were Americans, but his mother had lived in South America for a while, and she was also French, you know, for her family. And so in the home, they all spoke French. So when he, he spoke English, he had an accent. And because of his multilingual abilities, he could pose as people from different countries, different backgrounds. And it's interesting, he was a prosecutor before he joined the FBI, but he worked pretty much full-time undercover and he'd been doing it for years. And so I said to him, hey, you know, will you take me out on a cameo? A cameo is when you like do a guest appearance as an undercover agent. And, you know, like a one day thing and the experienced agent and writes a report on you and says whether you suck or whether you, you might have the ability to actually do this. Right. And I so I, I went out on this cameo with him and uh, the case was codenamed Run DMV. And I can talk about that because it was later uh, written about in the newspapers when we did the bus. And in that case, which I became the other undercover agent in it. Um, more than 40 people were arrested. It was, a, it, it was all over the news at the time. And people, who, um, some of the people arrested worked for the government. They worked at the DMV or they worked at INS. And so they were selling real driver's licenses, real vehicle re registrations, real passports to scumbags, to people who were terrorists, organized crime victors, drug dealers, human traffickers, et cetera. And so those people would use the real ID, but with false names. And it was in the system and everything. And so they could get 
in and out of the country or going across state lines. And if they got pulled over by a cop for speeding or whatever, they could produce this ID right. and it would look like they were somebody else. That's scary. And it was very scary. And so my very first day, I, <laughs> excuse me, I'm still getting over the flu. I went into a DMV office up in Yonkers and essentially bribed some corrupt people that we already knew were crooks. They were already selling the false IDs. I gave them some cash bribes and gave them photos of people. And then the applications filled out for people that obviously I wasn't, you know, for men and stuff who wanted the IDs. And then they produced the IDs and the vehicle registrations for me for the, for the, for the money. Right. And not everybody who worked in that office was corrupt. The manager wasn't corrupt. There were some other employees that weren't corrupt. And so in order not to get noticed going into the office repeatedly, because that would look pretty suspicious, like, why are you going in and out of the DMV? I had the idea to change my clothing and to change my hairstyle. And that was my idea. And it's something, you know, when you're thinking about it as an actress, you think about costume and stuff. So I had brought changes of clothes. And so I like changed clothes in the car and did my hair different, my makeup different, my jewelry different. And so the criminals who had been interacting with my undercover partner were really impressed with my expertise as a criminal. And they complimented <laughs> him about how professional I was. And they want professional, they meant professional as a criminal, like wow, <laughs> a professional yeah. criminal. And so I impressed the criminals and they wanted me to do more bribing for them. And so that's how it got me into the case. And that's that a great way to uh, dip your toes in the water and to be evaluated at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. But we sometimes took out other people that were experienced investigators, you know, great agents with conventional investigative work, whether it was like arrests, surveillances, searches, you know, building cases, really talented agents. But most of these people, they t were terrible in undercover work because it's a completely different skill set. Yeah. And you have to have the right kind of personality where you don't fold on that kind of pressure because it's different kind of pressure than going in to do an arrest. Because like, for instance, when you're going into an arrest, you're with other agents, you're armed, you know, you have backup. You're the authority figure. Coordinated. Um, you're controlling the situation. Whereas with undercover work, a lot of times you can't be armed and you have no backup. We jokingly called it mop up because if there was any backup, by the time they get in, they're like mopping up blood. You know, right. that's that's what we would jokingly call it. Um, so it's just a really different skill set, a different personality. You know, it's being able to work independent, to not fold into pressure, and also to improvise. Because things are fluid, you know, things change. And a lot of times like the criminals relate or they change, try to change terms of a deal and you have to not freak out and be able to go with it and put pressure on people to get what you want and, and not fold. And, and, you know, also like I had a gun put to my head once and it's just, so it's, it's very different, uh, but I love doing the undercover work because I knew I was making a big difference and right. getting horrible people off the street who were going to commit more crimes, you know, very dangerous people and, you know, who'd victimized individuals. And so I, I knew that it was really important work and something that I could do and that other people couldn't do. You know, to me, um, good people, empathic people, one of their biggest motivations is am i making a difference yeah no matter what field you're in whether you're undercover fbi agent whether you're a school teacher you know are you making a difference are you making people's lives better uh, which you did by taking all these bad actors off the street mm -hmm. um we're all human we all get scared can yeah. you talk about a few times uh when you were undercover, things that happened, like you mentioned the gun to your head, how that happened and, and sure. any other challenging times where you thought, oh shit, I might not get out of this, that kind of thing. There were a few times where I was genuinely terrified. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. One was, um, uh, there's an area of New York 
that's, you know, some people call it Alphabet City because the uh, streets are named after le- like Avenue A, Avenue B, Avenue C. And some parts of New York have been gentrified, you know, since the early 90s. I was doing this work in the early 90s, my undercover work. But back then, it was a really quite dangerous. There were housing projects. There was a lot of narco trafficking, other kinds of crime. And so one day, my undercover partner and I we were supposed to have a meet with a guy who was really an awful, awful individual. He was a human trafficker. So he was, you know, bringing people into the U.S. who then would end up being like slave labor. He was a horrible person. Um, he was also involved in counterfeiting and various other crimes. And so that part of the case had become a joint operation with the Secret Service. And so the Secret Service agents, because of the counterfeiting aspect, they were working as our backup. So they there were agents out in cars doing the surveillance, but they weren't like right next to us. And so there was this one day where this, this criminal, we'd already had multiple meets with him. We had a lot of evidence. You know, the FBI builds cases really carefully. You get a lot of evidence before you make an arrest. We already had him on tape doing, you know, criminal acts, lots of evidence. So this was going to be the culmination and we were supposed to bust this guy that day. And I was going to be buying a large quantity of counterfeit American currency from this guy. And then we were going to give the signal and he would get arrested. But as, like I said, things change and plans change. And he tried to lure us into going from Manhattan to Brooklyn under the guise of meeting the printer, the person who would actually print the counterfeit. And obviously, if you think about it now, if we've been stupid criminals or, you know, stupid people, we would have thought, oh, yeah, sure. I want to meet the printer. Let's go over to Brooklyn. But we realized that he was probably trying to set us up to be murdered. Because why on earth would you let someone meet your contact who is the source of the counterfeit currency they're, you're buying? Because then you could cut the guy out of the deal. Right. So we were smart enough to realize, and you know, smart criminals would have figured out this too, that he was not telling the truth and that he was probably setting us to, up to be murdered. And then he, he didn't want it. You know, maybe he was just going to take all our cash and kill us or who knows what he was going to do. But we had to convince him to still do the deal, but to come to Alphabet City in Manhattan and to not do it in Brooklyn, you know? So we refused to go to the printer and this, we were having to delay and delay and delay the meet because he was late and making all these phone calls and, and, you know, stopping off. And, and at one point while we were driving and waiting to do the meet, my partner who was nervous accidentally went down the wrong way on a one-way street. Mm. And a cop pulled us over and my partner didn't have any of his real ID on him. And I actually did have my ID, but it was hidden under some things in the glove compartment. And the Secret Service was surveilling, but they weren't near very close by. We had a transmitter in the vehicle, so they were listening. So this cop pulls us over and he points the gun at us and it's like right near my head. Yeah. And he he think he thinks we're criminals, but of the course, thing yeah. is, he was a dirty cop, and we realized that he was working for drug dealers, and we had to reveal the fact that we were law enforcement. But we he had his finger on the trigger, and and so like finally we like reveal we're law enforcement because we didn't want to get arrested or anything. So my partner didn't have any ID, and. I, and so I said, you know, I don't, we're here, you know, doing a meet, we're undercover. And I said, you know, I, we don't want you to say anything loud about this because it'll ruin everything. And he said, my finger's on the trigger. And so he was threatening us and he kept pushing, wanting to know what was the case about and pushing and we wouldn't tell him. You know, and finally, one of the secret service guys came up in a vehicle and identified himself as Secret Service, and then the cop left. And we were so relieved, but we realized that because of what he said to us, because there was more that was going on, because of what he said, we realized he was working for a local drug dealer, and he thought we might going to be busting the guy that he was protecting, that he was getting paid off by the drug dealer, and he was thinking of killing us. 
and well, revealing was, that you were law enforcement to this guy actually uh in this situation potentially made it worse <laughs> it made it worse in a sense but we couldn't like get what else arrested. could you do you know, it's yeah. like what could we do and we were in a really bad situation and so the secret service when they talked to the guy then the cop like backed off and i could see he was relieved because he thought, oh, this has nothing to do with drugs. This is like counterfeiting or something else because it's the Secret Service. And then he just left. But it was like one of those oh shit moments where yeah. it, it was one of the moments where like my life was essentially passing before my eyes. And I was thinking, am I going to go home? And then a few hours later, we managed to finally have the meet with the guy. And it was like, and, in, and it's like, there's highs and lows. And at the time, you know, I'm an actress and everything. We, we, uh, we got arrested too. I got arrested. My partner got arrested because we wanted to, because the other case was still ongoing. And so we didn't want to have this guy tip off other people and have them, you know, skip town. And so the secret service arrested everybody, including us. And then his lawyer was told that we were extradited to Florida on drug charges so that to protect the case. And it wasn't until later the guy found out that I was an FBI agent. My partner was an FBI agent. And, you know, there's all <laughs> but, this stuff but, undercover operation. But dumb question, but the Secret Service who arrested you, that they knew you were. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah they they met us ahead of time that morning like right. hours and hours before so the whole team could see who we were so they wouldn't kill us right. but you know it's i resisted arrest and, and tried to run <laughs> and, and i got hurled up against the car and roughed up you know yeah. this is for the benefit of criminals because it was not just the guy but his backup his other criminal compatriots so this was all happening in alphabet city so. well as an aside whatever happened to that dirty cop i i don't know yeah wow now my, my my case there's you know right. some there's a lot of a lot of things happening it's like I had to work on my actual case yeah it, you know it's amazing the people in the world who make a huge difference in it but they the public doesn't really ever know who they are what their name is but yeah. you're sure glad that those people are there like yeah. like like you doing undercover mm -hmm. yeah um any other interesting anecdotes before we move off of law enforcement? I mean, I'm sure there are a million, but there, there are lots. I mean, yeah. I, it, like I said, I did undercover work. I also did, you know, I worked another case where with my same partner that was against organized crime and crooked body shops. And, you know, it was like actual Italian OC guys. And, and then I worked undercover in an espionage case. And then I did, all of my normal counterintelligence work against the the Russians, and it was it was interesting, you know. And, yeah. and yeah. back then, like I said, I was a former model, and I was you know a pretty young thing in my twenties when I started out, and so occasionally I would, you know, my my looks were <laughs> useful, shall we say. <laughs> so yeah. sometimes when I was interacting with the Russians, it's like. They knew I was an agent, but I didn't dress like a normal agent. Sometimes I would approach them on the street, you know, and not yeah. honey trapping, but I would get their attention. They would talk to me more because I was not one of the typical <laughs> tall white dudes or black dudes wearing a suit, you know. I was the yeah, it's the, a factor, right? Coming in short shorts in the sunshiny day, approaching them in a different <laughs> capacity. <laughs> well, um, you've you've probably a couple questions. You've probably oh. been asked this before, but uh, have you considered, you know, any a, a series or a novel or blending horror with your experience in the FBI, anything like that? You know, just maybe that you should ask. Um, I'm, I'm. That's what I'm writing right now. Oh, great! Yeah, yeah right. the it's a supernatural thriller. One of the characters is an FBI agent who also happens to be a demon. <laughs> and uh, the other uh, main character is a human woman who is essentially a hit woman. And, but she does it for good. You know, she is not someone who's doing it for money. She's doing it to eliminate horrible people. So, well, when you get to get to that point, if you need a blurb, shoot it my way. So fantastic. Yeah. No, um, 
Today. Yeah, I can't wait to read it. I want to get that done this year and then work on the novel. So, what? <clears throat> excuse me. What would you say to the young person out there who uh, is listening to this and they want to get into law enforcement, or they want to get it? You know, they're they're thinking about could I possibly join the FBI or undercover? All that stuff. What would you say to them? Um. Well, I think law enforcement is a great career. It's an it's a noble career. Obviously, you want to be an ethical, uh, moral person, and there's a lot of pressures in the job. I have um, written about law enforcement and preventing and remedying misconduct. That's one of the areas I write about in terms of uh, nonfiction and legal. So if they want to read that, you can read those things on my website, too. But I would say that the FBI is the best organization I've ever worked for. You know, I've worked for law firms. I've, you know, worked for art galleries. I worked for Merrill Lynch. But it's, you know, the most highly trained law enforcement agents in the United States. Um, lots of camaraderie, you know. Sure, the FBI has had its flaws. There have been problems. But on the whole, great organization extremely competitive to get hired, extremely competitive. Um, there are different tracks to get hired. You know, I came into the diversity background. You know, I, I was from Merrill Lynch. I didn't have a law enforcement background. I wasn't a lawyer. I wasn't an accountant. Some people think, oh, you have to be a lawyer. You have to be an accountant. That's not true. You know, some of my classmates were lawyers. They were accountants. There were people who came in into the foreign language program. There were scientists, there were engineers, um, but I came in under diversity. I would just say that um, you don't necessarily want to study criminal justice when you're in college, study an area that really excites you, because in order to really learn, you have to be highly motivated and you have to be really interested in the subject matter. So study what you are really passionate about, learn about what you're passionate about, educate yourself, study criminal cases, you know, read, read about the FBI and other law enforcement agencies. And then obviously, if you're interested in career opportunities, go to FBI.gov and look at it because there are opportunities as agents and then there are support staff. And when I say support staff, that, that covers everything from like lawyers, scientists, analysts, people who do clerical work. And, you know, a person doesn't necessarily always have to start as an agent. There were people who were in my new agent training class who'd work for the FBI in other capacities before they became agents. But they're, the FBI hires all kinds of people. You have to be, if you're going to be an agent, you have to be physically fit. You have to be healthy because, you know, you have to be able to pass all the physical training right. and excel in that. I was an athlete. Um, you have to be a healthy person so you can, you know, maintain your your physique and chase people and and not pass out and get sick. You know, so you have to be a healthy person. But if you're somebody who has like disabilities, for instance, you could still work for the FBI in other capacities. So right. there, are, there are lots of places for people. Um, so, and you obviously can't be taking drugs. And you, even though marijuana is legal in a lot of states, like where I live in Illinois, you, you can't be using drugs. So if you are, stop. <laughs> because there's, there's a waiting period for marijuana. And then at harder drugs, it's even a longer waiting period. So right. Don't don't use drugs. Keep your associations clean. Don't hang out with criminals or other unsavory individuals. If you have a relative who's a criminal, you know, you can't control that, but you can distance yourself from that individual and just build on your skill set and also think about hiring trends because for instance, I've had people, a lot of times people contact me for advice and I've given speeches at law schools all over the country. And so sometimes I've had law students who talk to me and some of them later become FBI agents. I've advised them. But for instance, if someone is a law student and they're thinking about a career with the FBI, you don't want to just think about whether you would be hired as someone in the legal track. Now, when I say legal track, that doesn't mean you're actually going to be a lawyer for the FBI or do anything with your legal background. That's just one background of individual who is the type of person that gets hired. Right. But if someone also is fluent in foreign language, or if their undergrad was an engineering, or for instance, or if they're a former military, 
you know, you have to look at the hiring needs. And if you look at FBI.gov and then you'll look at USA Jobs, you'll see what the hiring needs are and needs change because like, let's just say someone has a Russian background and they're fluent in Russian, but they also have a law degree. They may be better off applying in the language track rather than the law track because there are fewer people that apply in that track, just depending upon, you know, it's the needs of the Bureau. So you have to keep track of that too. To circle back to horror um, before yes. we finish up, I yes. was I was curious about uh, you mentioned books that you read, crime books and so forth, yes. growing up because your because your father, your mother read horror. Mm. What are some of your horror influences, and who have you read, or what have you read recently that you really enjoyed? Oh, sure. Um, some of the books that I read recently, one of them is um, Wild Spaces by oh, yeah. S.L. Coney. It's a phenomenal novella. Just, uh, it's a beautifully written horror. It's a coming of age story, but it's obviously a lot more than that. The book yeah. was edited, uh, edited by Ellen Datlow, who is a phenomenal editor, published by Core. And when I, I I've read that, that's this, that's a wonderful little book. Yeah. When I first started reading this, I it read like a literary coming of age story, and there weren't any speculative elements in the beginning of the story, and that doesn't really start creeping in until later. So if you're someone who is expecting horror to like have the speculative elements like right away or crime elements right away, hang in there. Don't be disappointed because it is a phenomenal book. And it's just, it's visceral. It's poignant. You know, I mean, it's, it's really touching. And, you, you know, really I actually really enjoy it. horror books, horror stories that start that way, that are really grounded in reality. Yeah. because it 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 makes the the horror uh just that much more refreshing just that much more real in terms of the story that you're reading you know mm -hmm. so so that is a book that i read recently that i really enjoyed another book that i read recently that i loved and it's it's a different you know very different is the Kaiju Preservation Society by John Scalzi. Now, this is a... There you go, Pete. <laughs> this is a... I, you know, how do you categorize this book? Well, it's science fiction, it's horror, it's a thriller, and there's also, you know, it's tons of cements and there's a lot of humor. Um, terrific book. You see, you see the blood on the tag. You know, there is a, there is gore. There is There are plenty of monsters. It's... It's creative. It's engaging. I devoured it in like one sitting. Uh, it's it was just a really fun novel that it just you know it has a, a sharp pace and the characters are quirky and interesting. You know, the main character is very appealing, and you know you're going into another version of our world. You know where right. where the where the impossible is possible. And it's, it's a strange book. It's a quirky book. And I tend to like horror that has a bit splashes of humor in it. And so there was humor. And I found that to be uh, really engaging and enjoyable and just oh, yeah. a ter Pete, terrific Pete, book. Have you gotten to that one yet? Any any of us of you guys gotten to that one yet? I haven't gotten that one yet. It's in the stack. Oh, it's same great. Same yeah, same I love John Scalzi's work. And that, that, that was just a lot of fun. Um, another author who I love is Bria Sharma. She, you know, her collection in All the Fabulous Beasts is a short story collection, which is fabulous. And recently she came out with a novella called Orm Shadow. And it is really, it's another tour book. I think it was also edited by Alan Doutlow, but it's beautifully written. It's just the, the prose. The, the What's story. that about? Um, it's a coming I of age story. And it's it's dark, it's strange, you have family dynamics. So these two books do have something in common. They're, you know, but one set in the US, one set overseas, but they're both coming of age stories, right? Tour books. But Priya Sharma's uh, work is, you know, it's like tender, but it's visceral, and it's the prose is just rich. But it's not overly flowery. It's just, you know, her descriptions are you know, wonderfully wrought. And the character is really appealing. And I don't want to spoil it, but 
the speculative elements, you know, the fantasy elements, this monster elements are, you know, really interesting. So that, that was a, a book that I enjoyed a lot too. Um, so those are three books that I really liked. Another one that I read um, was Jeff Vandermeer is another author who I love. And so The Strange Bird is part of his um, Born series. And it is, this book I found very appealing because of the transformation aspects, the, the metamorphosis aspects. It's kind of, it's a dystopian. You have horror and science fiction all blended together. It's very weird. You know, if you, if you read Annihilation and, you know, some of his work, it's, yeah. it's weird, it's dark, but it can be beautiful too. And you, and the, the character, the bird character, you, you know, you really, can feel drawn to this this character and one thing you may notice is that a lot of the books i like have an, a non-human character in them so that's a a non-human character and some of the stories that i write myself have non-human characters but to me otherness and justice and um transformation and subjugation and that it, it's a it's a beautiful story and will it really well written you know you should uh the, <clears throat> in regards to what you just said you should check out uh, jeff thomas's books especially his punk town mm -hmm. uh series okay yeah it's yeah I, I have a feeling that you would really really like it yeah so right um well thanks for being on the show alicia i'm You're glad welcome. you came back yeah this has been wonderful yeah, really nice talking to you so yeah, back to Omni Park, folks. I'll have uh, the link in the show notes, as I said. And uh, yeah, thanks, Alicia. I'm, we're going to talk about a few other things. You're certainly welcome to stay, or if you're you need to run, that's out. fine too. Okay. Okay. All right. So, Pete Rollick. What? What are you? Your want? Miskatonic book is oh, yes. now on Kindle. Miskatonic University, University Spiritualism Spiritual Club. Spiritualism Club, yes. Yeah. It's, it's um, yeah. On Kindle, it's only five ninety nine. Yep. Um, fun little story, Christmas ghost story. Um, can, can you answer, Pete? Do you have yeah. to read Reanimatrix to enjoy this? I don't think so. Um, I think the characters stand on their own without knowing how they got together or there there's some hints about their special abilities but none of those really come into play I'm, i was just asking for the viewers because i think the same thing it's a very enjoyable it's a good read it's uh you could read it as your christmas ghost story yep a month late yes yeah um basically it's about uh two detectives in arkham who are hired uh to babysit uh, the Miskatonic University Spiritualism Club when they go to investigate a haunted house. This is a, set um, in 1928. Yep, set in 1928. So they go to this wonderful gothic eerie mansion on the cliff on the side of a cliff, and it's got all the all the regular characters. You this spooky old how uh, uh, groundskeeper who won't stay the night. Um, the the cast of characters. There's a there's a kind of a, a a a very big joke about the vast majority of the characters. Um, I know Rick knows. Matt, Matt, did you figure it out? What's that? Did you figure out the joke about all the characters? No, of course not. You, you like I said, so, what you're going to need is a hardcover edition of your output, but completely totally annotated. <laughs> So <laughs> annotated annotations. There the are vast the, the vast majority of the characters, uh, the male characters who appear in this book are have all been played by Vincent Price. Oh, oh, nice. Um in, in various uh movies. Um so there's that. And it also functions as a prequel to a secret prequel to one of my favorite films um 13 ghosts the wow. original the original yeah. black and white not not the remake um not that wonderful remake 
Uh, you know, it's not. A, I rewatched it recently, and yes, it's been updated, and yes, it has a lot of. It's a it's a different movie, and it has, it has a different premise, but it's it's not a bad film. It's not a bad horror movie. It's just not Thirteen Ghosts. Right. Um, it is in many ways a bastard child of Cube. Um, yeah, I can see that. Where the walls keep changing and the rooms have different rules, and you know you're going to die. It just matter depends on how, when, and where. Well, I'll include a link to the Miskatonic University Spiritualism Club, folks, and um, yeah, it's now on Kindle. If you want to, you can read it today. You know, so and uh, there's an interesting, th yeah, go ahead. There's an interesting tie-in. I did not create the Miskatonic University Spiritualism Club. Um, go on, go on. Arkham Bazaar created uh -huh. the Miskatonic University know. Spiritualism Club as a shirt. I didn't know that. They they started it as a shirt. Brian and Gwen Callahan printed up a shirt, and I was like, "That's a story." There's a there's a spiritualism club at Miskatonic University. There's a great story, and I so I asked them if I could I could write a story based on that shirt, and they said yes. So, casual viewers, Brian and Gwen Callahan run the Arkham Bazaar to raise money for the HPL Film Festival. Yeah, it's kind of like you know that actually. Pete, wasn't there a T-shirt for a Lovecraft and Tesla? It yeah. started out as a really cool T-shirt, and then someone turned it into a comic book series. Yes. Yep. And they said there were going to be fifty-four issues, eighteen graphic novels. Yeah. And, no, I, I don't nah, think it... they they punted. Mm -hmm. They got yeah. like nine individual issues done, and they left. Yeah. Well, by the way, Miskatonic, the Miskatonic University Spiritualism Club by Pete Rollick is illustrated by Dan Sauer. Yes. So uh, I haven't seen, had, is, I don't, I haven't seen a Kindle ball. version. I assume it translates somewhat to the Kindle. Yes, it does. Okay, good. Good. Well, Dan's a very talented, besides being a publisher, he's a very talented uh, artist. Um, I was actually taking pictures of the new office to send you guys today. I haven't sent them yet, but I've got one of his hanging up on the wall over there, which, which you can't see. Um, but it's very Halloween-y. I just made up that word. So, um, oh, I think Halloween-y's been around for a while. Has it? Has. Okay. Yeah. So, well, if you it's... don't know, okay, listeners, if you don't know Dan Sauer, uh, look up Jack Nape's Press, and that will yeah. give you Jack and Nape's Press. Nope. Uh, the actually the um the painting behind me that you can see just over my left shoulder here uh th that way that way that's done by john coin who was kind enough to send send it to me uh, you can look up his art on his website but he's an alaskan artist artist and i told him i really liked that one especially and he sent it to me so i just picked up a Spanish language edition of, I think it was the Dunwich Horror, mm -hmm. illustrated by him. Oh. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah, he's very talented. I, I don't need it because I've got that artwork, but I, I picked it up and uh, I I think it's up for sale at the, um, the Arkham Book Exchange. I'll include a link to, to John too. Um, and, and let me write now, Jack and Apes. And John Coin. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, our friend Sean Hamill said uh, this about the Miskatonic University Spiritualism Club. Imagine Nick and Nora Charles from the Thin Man films up against cosmic horror, Lovecraftian lore, and traditional ghost stories. And you're not far off from Pete Rollick's charming, funny, frightening, and moving Miskatonic University Spiritualism Club. So I wanted to mention that that's that's now on Kindle. So and of course still on print. And it, it's funny that Sean said that because that's the exact two characters I've mo modeled um, 
Megan and Robert after. I love the Thin Man movies. I not I don't think they're great mysteries. They're fun mysteries, but they have a great dialogue between the two characters. And Alicia's nodding her head because I think the chemistry is great. It's very yeah. fun. <laughs> so I, I wanted to um bring back re um my reanimatrix was was my nod to Laura and Nick uh Megan and Robert are my nod to Nick and Nora Charles. So it works out really well. Um you can this is my love of late night UHF television coming. Yeah, it's like you never knew what you were gonna get on UHF. You had yeah. like like Mon Pot Kettle, the Thin Man, Monty Python's Flying Circus. You you never knew exactly what you were gonna end up watching. But you know, we had four chan UHF channels out of Philadelphia, and uh we got to see a lot of fun stuff. That's where I discovered Doctor Who. Yeah. Well, I imagine most listeners know who Sandy Peterson is, creator of the Call of Cthulhu game, uh, role-playing game. We are going to be talking with Sandy this week, and I'll have the re the, the the recording of that up this week too. For the this is going to be for the patrons. So if you're not a patron, please think about it. There's all kinds of fantastic content in addition to. Uh, this podcast and it's it all starts at just five bucks a month um trying not to sound like a salesperson because i don't like being talked to that way myself but you know if you can afford five bucks a month and you want to keep this podcast going my various projects going then please consider it and that five dollars a month is the very bottom level and you get all of the patreon podcasts including this upcoming one with Sandy Peterson. And um, when you join, I've got a little post that I've got pinned to the top. You can, you can peruse to your heart's content because I've had the Patreon for several years, but I do note some of the uh, ones that you could start with if you're not sure where to start. For example, like the Laird Barron's the strange but true things that have happened to Laird Barron, for example, that that kind of thing. So we'll be talking with Sandy, and we're going to be talking about Alone with the Static, which is a new Call of Cthulhu RPG. And notably, it is for a single player. I'll just read this from their site. Set in the, set in the Dakota Black Hills in the early 1990s, Alone Against the Static is designed for a single player, no keeper required. You will choose to play as either Alex or Charlie, each of which have their own strengths, weaknesses, and choices to make. No two, and this is important, no two playthroughs will be the same. So I'll include a link to that as well in today's show notes and, uh, of course, in the Patreon podcast. So... So uh, these are kind of yeah, like yeah, go ahead. Thematic. These are kind of like thematic sequels to Alone Against the Fire or Flames and Alone Against yeah. the Frost. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I just got Static, uh, not too long ago. As soon as they released it, I ordered it. They're um, they're solo adventures. They're for the seventh edition of Call of Cthulhu. Uh, and you, I've played like Alone Against the Frost. I've played I think eight times. Wow. And there are mul there are multiple. It's not just one or two endings you can get. So you wait, might not get wait. to the end. Mike, Mike, don't you have yep. any friends? I mean, you played by yourself <laughs> eight times. As, <laughs> no, just... it's as as long as I've got money. Yeah, sure. Um, but <laughs> but then all those hookers just go. I mean, strippers. I mean, <laughs> uh, life's not perfect. But uh, they have. He's been immense... snorting up that money every day. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I learned. I learned it from you, Uncle Pete. Um. <laughs> I learned it so, from watching you. <laughs> but like Pete said it was okay. I have, why don't, why don't I, we have I, more I viewers, the, Mike? I don't get it. I don't know. We, we're not running them off, are we? Uh, those 
they're real they're a lot of fun if you like the game the replay value is obviously it's great so you're getting your money's worth plus you'd learn if to make keep it short but if you're not familiar with the system you can learn very easily by doing that like that's an important the, point yeah yeah the first one you can get free off their website the pdf and it it's designed for you've never played it before so it kind of holds your hand and walks you through it and it's very enjoyable so i'll include the link to alone against the static um in it's a drive through RPG, of course. But here's a, just quickly, here's a review at uh, elruneblog.blogspot.com. Uh, two well-known tropes of horror films are TV, static, and found footage. When I first watched Hideo Nakata's masterpiece, The Ring, Ringu, I'm not afraid to admit it scared the bejesus out of me. Only days later, I was sitting in front of an apparently switched off TV with a built-in VCR. We'll explain that later for you younger folks. Doing a homework all alone when suddenly it sprang to life with static and filled the room with a loud white noise. My heart almost jumped out of my chest. Um, it was on. Luckily, the reason behind that phenomenon was totally ordinary, but during that couple of seconds before my mind finally managed to understand, I felt horror. And um, Alone Against the Static may well be playing tribute to uh, those films like Blair Witch Project and so forth, as both are born from the late 90s. And this adventure is also set around that time. But uh, long story short, Alone with the Static has gotten really great reviews. And we're going to we're going to talk to the, the the Call of Cthulhu King himself, Sandy Peterson, this week. So if you're if you're not a Patreon, um, just you know just Google Lovecraft Easy in Patreon, or I include the link in the show notes. So that's uh, Lone Against the Static. Um, okay, Rick. Now I know you said me not being 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 more of a DC fan than a Marvel fan. Though, although I did enjoy the films, Avengers and all the all those, but you said that the second season of If might be a little too esoteric for me or out there. So what I did was I just watched the very last episode, and that's it. It uh, and it gives a little preview and everything. So I got got a taste of it. I thought it was really good. Good. Yeah. I would have had to watch the uh, third, the second episode, the third episode. Third episode? I can, I can go back and do yeah, that. Happy Hogan and Christmas. Well, as I said on my Facebook page, my favorite part of the last episode of If is when Captain Carter fights the Balrog and screams, "You shall not pass." So now, <laughs> exactly what it reminded me of. It was meant to. What's that? It was meant to do that. Yeah, I'm sure. But, but uh, I mean, if you but if you're watching the second season of What If, then you're you have to play the game. What movies are these? Yeah. You're like Die Hard is uh, the Happy Hogan story. Yes. So. Yeah. No, I didn't realize that, but yeah, that that was apparent to me watching it. And I thought it was a really fun episode. And the yeah. Iron Man one is sort of a uh, Mad Max combined with uh, Phantom Menace. Mm, cool. Hmm. Yes, okay. you're right. Pod race, sort of. Pod racing. Yes, have some. Uh, all right. Anything else we want to talk about? I've got a few more things here, but I don't want to monopolize. Does anyone have anything they want to discuss? We could mention Necronomicon. The uh, tickets are going on sale, I think, the 12th right. for the so, Rhode Island Convention. So in Necronomicon, typically the number of tickets are limited 2, to 1,200 to 1,400 based on the size of the venues and the restrictions of the fire marshal. So it's not a huge convention. On the other hand, I've never known anyone who wanted to go who couldn't get a ticket. I mean, it's not like you're going to be kicked out, but... This is your chance to assure that you have your place reserved. Now, 
they used to have three tiers. They would have the gold key members. Now those are the ones who got to, they got a black robe. They got to sing in the Eldritch choir. That's been eliminated because there was uh, a lot of complaints about they sold out like within like a minute of going yeah. on. Also people didn't get a chance for them. So they're not doing that tier, but they are doing the silver key which is you get a special little silver key and you get to spend extra money. And you um, have to go through the gates first. Right. But the, the, the thing is there's going to be add-ons for everything. So the prayer breakfast, the Cthulhu prayer breakfast, or usually Cody Goodfellow stands up and gives a sermon in his own um, hallucinating way. Uh, there is the, um, Eldritch Ball, which is a formal dinner dance. They sell something like 300 tickets and people go in costume. Our own panelist, Bridget Brenmark and her husband, Mike, they got in the New York Times in their costumes last year, uh, the last time it was in 22. So maybe they will again this year. Uh, that's quite fun. I stopped going to it because Isabel doesn't go and I'm more of a wallflower anyway at those things. But if that's you really true. like the music and all that kind of stuff, it's quite the spectacle there's anything that you want to do there there are live performances by the hpl historical society but they have live productions of plays by other groups they have live musical performances they have story recitals so there's all kinds of live entertainment there are panels some of them are informative uh like people talking about the history of graphic novels associated with weird fiction some of them are scientific. They actually have an Armitage Symposium or scientific papers get presented or scholarly papers. Like if you've done some research about like, uh, say, women authors who interacted with Lovecraft and what happened later in their career and you want to present something, you can get a paper presented. Um, they present awards to people who have participated. There's gaming sessions all the time. Oh my gosh, there's like, really you will not be able to fun. go to everything. They designed it that way. You may be going up the hill to the Hay Library at Brown University to see what they have on display. You may be going to the Athenaeum. Sometimes they'll have a lecture. They will have the Ars Necronomica with the huge art exhibits scattered across the city. You can go on a walking tour of Lovecraft's Providence with a docent, and they can tell you about all these cool buildings that he wrote about. Or you can hang out at the bar the entire time with yeah, others. I was going to say, I'm just going to be like parked in front of my hotel room, like parked in front of my mini bar. But there are there are two things that I really enjoy that I've done in the past. One is Providence is really a foodie city. Oh yeah, you can eat something different in a different cuisine almost every night within walking distance of the hotel. Um. Now, we tend to like pub food, so we tend to go back to the same pubs, but that's, you know, either here or there. The other thing is there's – it started off small, but now it's really big. The, the The film festival portion of the convention, the films that they show are really good. So you understand that the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival is every year in Portland, but they have a sister festival in Providence. And the sister festival in the off year is on its own, but they marry it to this convention in the Necronomicon year. So as part of your pass, if you wanted to instead to go to the Black Box Theater and see some of the short subjects, see some of the long subjects, listen to Gwen Callahan interview some of these filmmakers. She's really good at it. Um, yep. You can do that. I, I personally like to go to things I can't see anywhere else. So I tend to skip out on panels now instead to go to performances of like, they had the New York Radio Theater do the Curse of Yig like two festivals ago and it was marvelous. Yeah. Yeah. They've so, had the play Night Gaunts, the play Monstrous Invisible. They've, they've had live plays performed. Well, there's lots of stuff to do there. You just can't even. Yeah, it's, it's every other year. And this year it's on at the end of August, right? Am I remembering that correctly? Tickets go on sale as as you guys have said, in just a few days. The other thing before we move on that I want to mention about Necronomicon is it is just very, very friendly. It, it, you know, you can meet people. Um, 
it there's it it tends to attract good people and the ones who are a disruption tend not to repeat you know you know so, mike davis will let you hang out with him for twenty dollars for every half hour yeah that's <laughs> so, true. so he will uh, sign your gear he will sign uh, your girlfriend's arm you know it's like he just he'll do anything for money but that's the way he is <laughs> Okay. Well, you're not coming back to the podcast. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. And it, it's, it's fun to hear from people who are there and they enjoy the podcast. I'll never forget when Joe was alive. Uh, one person went up to him at an economic con and told him that he was their favorite character on the Lovecraft easy show. <laughs> so I gotta say, god rest joel joel pulvers or whatever it's like yeah. he the first necronomicon i went to was the first time i met him in person and what impressed me about him was there's a young girl there who's clearly on spectrum she probably had asperger's and she was just she was young i don't even think she was 20 she was just running around talking to everybody in the vendor's room but everyone was looking out for her especially joe making sure that nobody was just brushing her off or being mean to her and that's what mike was saying about the friendly convention it's like you know i have not had any instance there where i went up to anybody yeah except mike davis where they they didn't oh, want to God hang sake. out with me <laughs> you know it, yeah it's 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 very friendly i uh, i will tell you you know, the past is the past and we can't bring it back. I love, love, love going to Necronomicon, but I will always miss seeing Joe parked outside a pub or his hotel, um, you know, standing there talking to everyone who would, would come up. Joe just loved to talk about weird fiction, horror, cosmic horror. He was really in his element. And, um, you know. Here's, here's your chance to meet Derek Hussey of Hippocampus Press. Yeah. You know, here's your chance to Michael meet- Michael Cisco, so many uh, people. Joe Browers, the the sculptor. He is, he and his wife, I they, they were just so friendly when you go up to the booth and just chat about anything. You can bring your books to get signed. Bring a copy of the Miskatonic Spiritualism Society Pete Rollick is going to be so intoxicated, he'll probably give you money and let pay you to let him sign it. I mean, there's so many fun things to do there. It, it's not, you know, you can walk the streets of Lovecraft, but sometimes, uh, I don't know if it's this year, but they have that Firewater Festival. And sometimes the weekend activity corresponds with the Firewater Festival in Providence. So, We've gone there. We played at a Lovecraftian escape room. You, you know, there's all kinds of things to do there. Yeah. So anyway, Matt, yeah, get yourself who, a ticket. No, Matt. Matt, Matt yeah. who did the Necronom Nom Nomicon? Oh, the, um, the art by in both those books was by Kevin Komodo. Okay. That, so that's the only one I remember, he actually, if you bring your copy, he, I, I can't make him do anything. You know, nope. ask him nicely. He drew an individual piece of art in my book and he signed it yeah it's so like jason eckhart drew an actual individual drawing in my hp lovecraft cat book and signed it kevin komoda anywhere else yeah Pete. kevin komoda took my copy of the necronom nomicon on thursday and didn't return it till sunday <laughs> and the entire end page it's just this massive piece of art. Wow. Wow. And I'm just like. And he's really good too. And he's <laughs> really, really good. He's like, he's the only guy who I think ever has drawn the elder things properly. He gets five. They get five wings. Wow. Um, it's just amazing. The other guy who doesn't get a lot of credit and they're, they're talked about, but he's there almost every year is Bob Eggleton. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, first of all. The guy paints beautifully and he paints in several genres. Like you would think of dragons as one of his themes. Spaceships is one of his themes. Sea monsters, one of his themes. 
but he does incredible Lovecraftian paintings. Yes. Um, he usually will have a work at the necro at the uh, Ars Necronomica, like his his magnificent new Green Cthulhu was shown, I think, two years ago. I don't know who the featured artist is. We have to wait to hear who's going to be like is was it David Santiago last year last time or something? I forget. Uh, Bob Eggleton. You can go. If he has a table, he will talk to you, but he is a, a reserved person to people that he doesn't know. Yeah. Uh, I think he's been burnt in the past by people trying to take advantage of his good nature. And now he just tends to be somewhat reserved, but he is happy to sign anything for you. And uh, you can buy prints of his magnificent work if he has a table, but he may only be at the Ars Necronomica. Right. Um, I've, so I've, 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 I've actually begged... Um, uh, the guy from Centipede Press to put out an art book for Bob Eggleton. Jared oh, Rogers? yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. yeah. I, I keep mentioning it every time I see him, and he keeps saying, who are you? Stop bothering me. <laughs> Police! Security! So, what, what part of restraining order don't you understand? <laughs> so, for those who don't know yet, my new uh, podcast, the first episode is out. It's a horror fiction podcast with uh with a focus on weird fiction writers working today um it's uh it's called the weird library listen in the dark it's now on um, apple spotify it's on youtube and i'll include a link to that in the show notes as well i hope everybody enjoys it we're going to have another episode coming out this week this first step uh, for those of you who are familiar with the old cbs radio mystery theater i'm a big fan of it and, and as well as that's from the 70s as well as the older old time radio from the 30s 40s and early 50s and eg marshall did sort of an um, a host introduction to each story and and an outro um, and just commenting on the story a little bit and so forth. So I'm kind of paying homage an homage to that. I'm introducing the stories and um, so this this past when Bridget Brenmark went all out, she's providing the art and the music for the podcast. And in addition, in this first episode, she narrated the story. Um, so I hope you check it out. I'll have the link in the show notes. And again, it's called the weird library. You can listen to it on YouTube, on, um, um, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also, I've got a Facebook group where you can sign up for updates and I have a mailing list that I link to as well from that podcast. And it's the only time you ever get an email is when there's a new episode that's it you're not going to get spammed and you can hit the unsubscribe button anytime you want to so i hope everybody enjoys it if if you've listened to it and you've enjoyed it um send me a note let me know um lovecraft easing at gmail.com uh to bronzo you listened to to it a couple times for me didn't you yeah yeah i actually the one you sent me and i uh, yeah, what you yeah, said. Yeah, the one I sent you was I, I, the final version. Yeah, I was just. Yeah, uh, Black Shuck by Emma Gibbons. Right. Which exactly. is a great story. Black, to start Black off Shuck with. Tavern, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, Bridget went. She did a fantastic job of doing the reading and the music. So it's a very good start. I mean, yeah. I'm looking forward to what comes next. So, um, I mean, there are a lot of. There are, there are other horror fiction podcasts out there, and I recognize it that. But. With this, I'm trying to focus on weird fiction writers working today. It's short story, um, out, short stories out by them, and hopefully make it a really enjoyable experience. Yeah. So, uh, the next, I'm sorry. Yes, it sounds fantastic. Oh, thank you. So, thank you. Um, the uh, the next the next episode is going to be will be featuring a story by Larry Baron. So, there you go. Oh. Which story, Mike? 
you're going to have to wait and find out. <laughs> Speaking of stories, uh, Gamut Magazine, I stumbled across a, yeah, excuse my ignorance, but is this a new magazine? Do you guys know? Online no, it's magazine? not. Uh, Richard Thomas is actually a friend of mine. Uh, Gamut was a magazine. Oh, uh, I remember now. Okay. Yeah. It was edited by Richard Thomas, and now it's been resurrected. And funny you mentioned that because I'm going to be teaching a class through them. Um, oh, really? Um, House of Gamut. I think that's the website, House of Gamut. Um, they are going to have a writing academy, and I'm going to teach a course about writing crime fiction. And that will be scheduled. The information about it will be on the uh, House of Gamut website pretty soon. So my my confusion is, yeah, it's houseofgamut.com, G-A-M-U-T. My confusion is they've reprinted, they're reprinting stories on the web from before. Is that correct? Um, they have um, a best of Gamut essentially an, an anthology of reprints from the original gamut magazine that i think was just published and you know in book form and okay. i think that's available in paperback and an ebook and then the magazine's first issue in its new incarnation is um just out also that okay that thank you i'm glad you were here to explain it to me because that's what i was that's, confused about that's news stories and poetry and nonfiction, you know essays about yeah because i kept thinking gamut gamut it's it's familiar but maybe my fibro fog is you know playing with my brain here because i just i just i found issue one and specifically a story by a guy by the name of sam Reddle rebel line r-e-b-e-l-e-i-n and the title of the story is i'll include this link as well we never went away we just hid better and it's it, the short story focuses on something that i think is extremely interesting which is of course the uncanny valley mm -hmm. so so folks check that out it's free to read so which is always nice and of course free to read this whole project started off 13 years ago as a online magazine and all of those stories are still at Lovecraft Easing's website. Uh, you can go there and you can read hundreds of weird fiction and Lovecraftian and Cthulhu mythos stories and so forth. Stories by Willem Pugmire, Joe Pulver, Pete Rollick, Rick Lay, all kinds of people. So, I've never heard of any of these people. You never well, they're good. Trust me. You just go with me on this. Yeah. Um, all right. Anything else, guys? I'm gonna make a recommendation. If you have BritBox, BritBox, there is a new adaption of uh, Lot Number Two Forty Nine, directed by Mark Gaddis, starring Kit Harrington and Freddie Fox. It's really well done i really enjoyed it um that's the mummy story that's well yes it's the mummy story it's the mummy story written by arthur conan doyle and um which Mark may have Gattis, originated in that genre of mummies coming alive yes and in fact um uh one of the things that mark gaddis does is that he ties it to sherlock holmes hmm. um very very subtly but it's it's very nicely done um but i i think kit harrington and freddie fox really just do a fabulous job I, i've only seen fox in a few other things and his portrayal in this of of just someone who is like completely immoral really reminds me of herbert west and so, uh, this is a short subject though right it's, yeah, it's only like an hour long um really good um uh great uh cinematography great special effects wonderful acting uh everything i expect from from gaddis yeah he does good work that's for damn yeah. sure he did a, a a series of uh adaptions of of uh benson stories the ghost stories um for the bbc and they came out 
before Christmas last year, I think. At least that's when I got access to them. And they were great. Um, they had Acorn as well? Yeah, I think so. Well, last but not least, um, our friend Rebecca J. Allred, along with Gordon B. White, wrote a book recently titled And In Her Smile, The World. And In Her Smile, The World. And I'll include a link to this as well, and I'll just read the first line. What if the world you thought you knew was a lie older than God? Now, not only is Rebecca a wonderful writer, she's also a wonderful person. I had some health issues lately, and she volunteered out of the blue volunteered to you know give me some medical advice when I wasn't receiving any so just so you know about Rebecca she is yeah. an MD she's a pathologist but apart from being a pathologist and a writer she's an artist she paints um, so she's pretty remarkable yeah a lot of talent and even more importantly a really good person so I'll include that link and I hope that Really, this is a great, good book. Besides, you well, know, she in, in the anthologies I edited, she wrote uh, probably the one of the best stories in each book. I mean, she's really good. Yeah, so check it out. And in her smile, the world. Um, Alicia, you got to tell me what you think when you get around to it. You got to okay. tell me what you think of uh, uh, the man in the picture by Susan Hill. I will do that. So yeah, are you an audio audiobook person? Not really. I'm okay. I mean, that's fine. I'm a really visual person, and I find that if I'm just listening and not visually looking at something, I don't absorb the material well enough. Well, for those of you who are that are going to pick this up, if you are, the narration is exceptionally good in this, and of course, um, just or you can pick it up in Kindle or uh, or print as well. Matt, the the price. Yes. Remember, it is a copy of the graphic novel, Volume 1 of The Old Guard. If you want to try and win it, send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com. Put guard in the subject heading. We will draw a winner in like six, seven weeks. Maybe it'll be you. Well, guys, thanks for being here. Hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day. Um, Alicia, it was really great talking with you. I, I think you're a very interesting person, and I'm glad you came back on the show. Thank you so much. It was wonderful being here. I really enjoyed the discussion. All right. Well, thanks. And Alicia, I'm facilitating that restraining order against Mike right now. So. <laughs> against, against which Mike, though? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> yeah. Better, better, better save than sorry. sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. A special thanks to the patrons who keep the whole, to keep the train on the tracks. And we'll see you next time.